Welcome, and thank you for tuning in to episode 115 on the Healthy Runner podcast, where we help you get stronger, run faster, and become a lifelong injury-free runner. Today, I have our very own Healthy Runner coach with us today to share a value-packed episode on how to add in interval running into your training. Thanks for coming back on the show, Coach Lou. Uh, <laughs> All right. So today, guys, I want to know, are you a runner who wants to know how to do interval runs or incorporate running speed workouts to get faster? Have you wondered, how do I run intervals? And is interval running good for beginners? Or maybe how fast should you run intervals? Or how do I track, how do I do track workouts for distance running? Um, if you have ever tried doing interval track workouts in the past, but you either didn't complete the workouts or you find yourself getting injured when you start to add these into your training, then this is the episode for you. Coach Lou is a 258-16 Boston Marathoner, so he knows a little something about speed and how to train to get faster for half marathon and marathon distances. So in this episode, our very own Coach Lou will cover what is an interval run, what is the benefit of interval runs, is interval running good for beginners, where is the best place to run intervals, how do I run intervals, how do I do a track interval, how fast should you be running your intervals, or what pace should you be doing, um, how long is an interval run to begin with, and then how often should you be doing interval runs. Um, we're going to also give you specific examples of track workouts that we give our clients and we program for them. So this is going to be super helpful. Um, Coach Lou, before we get into the content, let's do a little catching up for those new members in our community. Um, do you mind just sharing who you are and what do you do? Sure. Hi, everyone. This is Coach Lou. I'm a chemist in the, as a day job, but in my, in my free time, I run a lot. I qualified for Boston and ran Boston last year, break free, broke free um, for, for the first time. And I'm one of the healthy runner coach and I'm helping a lot of clients and athletes reach their goals. I'm very happy. I'm a personal trainer as well. Um, yeah, so I'm really into this all kind of running related fitness stuff. And I'm very happy to share my experience with everyone. I learned a lot along the way. I started running my first half marathon in 2017 and marathon the same year and have made a lot of mistakes. And, uh, but I learned a lot too. And I can't wait to share with you. Yeah, no, well, Coach Lou is very passionate about this topic today. So I knew once, um, once I figured out, hey, we haven't had a deep dive on interval running yet. We've done on tempo runs. We've done on strides before. We've done on different types of runs, but we never had like a deep dive episode on interval running. I knew he was the guy to go to because he loves this stuff. Um, he's like, I like to say our analytical guy, um, and he really <laughs> loves these workouts. So I know this is going to be super helpful, but let's catch up on, I know you had mentioned, you know, your sub three hour Boston marathon for your first Boston marathon in the fall there, that um, weird kind of timing of the year after COVID of running the Boston marathon. Um, and the last time we had spoke was in episode 95 in October, after you had that amazing performance um, and you shared your whole Boston Marathon recap. So for those who are running Boston uh, next month and you haven't checked out that episode, definitely check out episode 95 because Coach Lou shared a lot of great tips on how to navigate the actual course, how to actually prepare for the Boston Marathon from like a mindset standpoint, from a physical standpoint. Um, I think you'll you'll get some great tips, even if I've I had a lot of feedback from those that have run Boston many times and they still found that episode very valuable and helpful. So for those that are running Boston, check out episode 95. Um, but I'm really curious to hear um, Lou. Lou is kind of one of our local coaches here in Connecticut, um, but I actually physically haven't seen him a whole lot. Um, weather's been kind of 
crappy here in Connecticut this winter. It's been like a weird winter. We've had like some extreme cold temperatures. We had a bunch of like icy road conditions. Then we had a couple of snowstorms, not like terrible, terrible in terms of like the inches of snow that we got this year. But um, how has your winter training been going um, for Boston? That's actually less than a month away now, huh? Five weeks. <laughs> five weeks away. Okay. Yes. Five weeks away. How, how's Monday. the training been going? It's on, it's on Monday too. So five five weeks a Monday. The training is hard. <laughs> I have to say training is hard. In winter, we just have to take more time to warm up. It just takes more time, a lot more. And track, of course, most of the time is covered in snow, but every once in a while it's melted. So I was able to do that maybe three, four times in the whole winter. Well, before it starts, it's, um, before January is it's fine, but January is super hard. Um, yeah, it's in winter, the training really hard. I especially winter when you do slow runs, that's fine. But when you go anytime you go faster, because the lung doesn't like cold air, the lung likes warm, moist air. And when you do fast runs, it's just impossible. The, so that what we can do is have warm up our body. So the core is very warm and so that the lung is warm. And so that that's why another reason you need a longer warm up. Um, yeah, no, that's a great point. And, and I know I've seen a bunch of your runs that you've done in really cold conditions. Have you utilized the treadmill at all for like faster running this winter? No, nope. you've done it all out in the cold and <laughs> the elements. Wow. <laughs> it's part that's of hard. training too. That is true. And I know you've commented on a lot of your posts within our Healthy Runner Facebook group about that, um, the mental aspect of that. And I think that's something that doesn't really, uh, a lot of people don't play into the, the picture, especially if you're running Boston. Um, and especially if you really want a good marathon time, um, like you said, if you are in a cold weather climate, um, it is hard to, to train at that level, um, in this cold. So like kudos to you and kudos to you for really Smart. getting over those like mental hurdles. Um, any words of advice uh, or encouragement that you have for those that may be continuing to run in the cold um, this next month leading up to Boston? Yes, January was super hard. I was struggling, but really there are two things you can do. One is think of your why. There's a saying, he who knows why can bear any how. So that's one thing. And think of your why. Why do you want to run it? Why, why are you training for it? Think of that whenever you, you want to go back or you want to give up, think of the why. Second, find a support group, supporting group, the community. So helpful. It's, uh, it makes a whole lot of difference when you run with friends. So I when I go to track work with other people, and even though we are doing different workouts, my friends, the, the friends simply being there, you feel the support. Let's say if if I pass out, someone's gonna call the whole nine one one that I know. So that's helpful. <laughs> Hopefully, it doesn't happen. <laughs> <laughs> I hope not. <laughs> <laughs> but having that friends there uh, for the moral support too. And, and just to feel like you're not alone, right. You're not doing it alone and um, that there's others who are grinding it out with you. Right. And, and getting in some hard quality runs and um, any, I know you've been coaching a bunch of our athletes. Um, any, any athletes you want to give a shout out or any like wins that have happened recently that you think is, is worth sharing um, with some that, you know, might be struggling right now with their running. We, we have Ken who's running Boston as well. In, he was part of the spar back program before and has some still, he's still battling some ankle pains, but it's getting better and his weekly mileage just is going over 50 miles per week. So he's, uh, he's in a good shape. He's, if, if we have the old way, like if you have a pen, just stop running and then she could, couldn't, couldn't have done any of the training. 
So he's has some ankle issues, but then with the workout, with the exercise that Dwayne give her, gives him, and he's actually getting better, even though his training volume get higher. And he's uh, rocking the long runs, sometimes with spice. Uh, That's so great. No, I'm better. sure he loves those uh, runs that you program for him. Um, yeah, Ken is, is one of our winners who we originally started um, working with for kind of hamstring tendon pain. And I, I believe I shared his story on like a previous episode um, at some point. So you guys might have uh, be familiar with that name, but he, he did an amazing job getting a BQ at his local marathon, the Detroit free press marathon. And, um, you know, really once I am kind of done really helping someone kind of get out of pain. And then this is what we do is we kind of work collaboratively as a team um, with our coaching team and really coach Lou now is his primary coach. And because Lou knows how to really program those uh, Boston uh, ready runs um, definitely better than I do. So, you know, I know my strengths, I know my weaknesses and I know when to refer out and um, Lou's been doing a great job with him. And like you said, you know, some minor kind of ankle issues we've been able to you know streamline that and kind of i got pulled in um for a little consult and you know to make sure that ken was keeping up with the training because you know if you lose one week or two weeks and you're on your road to boston it's it's tough to catch up from that right and in terms of like running fitness wise and yeah so ken's doing very well and francisco <laughs> he's running his first marathon but he's absolutely killing it he's um well, Francisco is amazing. He's found his like talent for run like recently uh, in his fifties, and and then he just killing it. He's um he he's doing everything that he's supposed to, and then yeah, just make huge progress along the way. Yeah, I love I love seeing Francisco's progress training for his first marathon, right? Uh, Providence. So I love it. I love it. Um, and then, yeah, I see even we got Holly here on the live and Holly's uh, Holly. killing her half marathon training. Um, you're doing great, Holly. Um, Holly's doing, keep up. He's, he's doing well. Um, actually, Holly has some um, pain and injury before. So we trained last cycle. She, she was able to finish her first half marathon without injury. And now she's actually ready to take some more serious runs and we just start to get some spice in actually. I love it. I love it. Oh, that's awesome. Holly. Yeah. Congrats to you. Um, kudos to you. And so thank you for uh, catching up here, um, Lou. So guys, as we get into this kind of interval running content, like I said, this is going to be super valuable for you. So if you find any value in what we share with you today, can I just ask you for a favor? Can you share this episode out with a running friend of yours? Like literally, if you're watching on Facebook, um, tag them in the comments. If you're watching this on the Sparky Training YouTube channel, like hit copy, share link. If you're listening to it on the podcast, Spotify, Apple, copy, share link, text a friend, a running buddy of yours, send him a message, send it in the email, uh, because this is going to be super, super helpful. And this is probably like one of the main reasons I've seen so many injured runners over the years is because they do this type of run the wrong way, or their bodies aren't ready for the type of interval run that their watch said they should have been doing, or their generic HH program that they pulled off the internet, everyone knows who I'm talking about, um, you know, said they should be doing, right? So it really wasn't um, meant for their body. So Coach Lou's going to be sharing some valuable, valuable content today. So all I ask for you is if you can reward him for taking all the time uh, to put this content together for you by sharing it with a running friend of yours. All right, Coach Lou, let's get into this here. So let's start with the easy question. Uh, what is an interval run? An interval, interval run is interval. So you alternate, alternate the speed between fast runs and slow runs in a short definition. And that in a, broad sen in a broader, broader sense, a stride can be an interval because you run fast a few couple of 30 seconds a minute, and then you recover, just slow jog and then back. So it's, a, it's an easy type of interval runs, low stress. 
Right. So the focus is more on kind of running form. And we did a deep dive with Coach Whitney on the podcast before about how to do strides. Um, so you guys could definitely check that episode out. But that would be technically a form of you're running faster for this certain period of time, right, is what you're really saying. Um, yeah. So you're kind of switching between faster running and then recovery running. Right. Yes. So we're kind of going back and forth. All right. So what is the primary benefit of interval runs? So interval runs, you switch between fast and slow runs. So the, in general, the benefit is that you want to get faster. You want to go to faster runs. And that's what interval runs help you. To be more strict, it's interval runs are at your uh, target to improve your VO2 max. That's, you see all the kind of Garmin VO2 max, right? VO2 max is the... Um, the amount of oxygen, the amount of oxygen your body can consume per minute per kilogram of body. So you can imagine if you if your body is very efficient, your muscle is very efficient of burning oxygen, you can make generate more energy so that you can run faster. And the interval, you you go fast and then recover. Usually the recover shouldn't be too long because you want to be at a high intensity, high intensity as much as possible. So you have a fast run, a slow recovery, and then go back again. So repeat. So it's allowing really your body and your heart rate to kind of, you know, so excel at this higher rate. So this is at a high heart rate. You're really working at a high intensity Yes. And then you're allowing that recovery for it to come down a little bit. So you recover and then we hit it again at a high intensity. And the yes. primary really goal is from what you're saying is to run faster, right? Yes. So how many people on the live right now, curious, want to run faster, right? Like I literally should be seeing all of you in the comments. And if you're listening to this on the podcast and you're like running and you're like, uh, yeah, like who doesn't want to run faster? Um, I don't know anyone who doesn't want to run faster, right? So this is the primary um, or one of the runs that will allow you to run faster, but this is the run that you're actually running the fastest yes. during, right? So is this run, um, this interval running, actually good for beginners. So if I'm a new runner, I've just started, I'm a beginner runner listening to the podcast. Um, you know, when should we actually start to incorporate these types of runs into our running? So for beginners, it depends. I know. I hope you listen to that right here. It is. If you have, if you're just recovering from injury, absolutely no. Otherwise you're going to see the one soon. <laughs> <laughs> or <laughs> if you have a very low mileage, no, we'll get back to that soon. So th that happens after a base building. So you have a lot of mileage in your belt. So relatively, you have a certain amount of mileage under your, on your foot. And you have the base building. We have that covered that before. So you have the base. You are very consistent. You like, you run three times, four times a week, uh, a days a week, four, three, four time, uh, times a week, and you have certain mileage and you don't have injury. If there's anything discomfort, it should be below three out of 10 on a scale of 10, because interval essentially is training you to run fast. To run fast, there's a lot of high, very high impact to your body. Um, that's when you have all this cleared, and you have the after base building, then you can consider the interval run. And I usually start with the strides. That's a nice transition between the easy run and the interval runs. Excellent. So from what I heard from that is you have to have that base training. And again, guys, that's episode 105. I feel like I'm going to reference that episode probably in every single episode, just because it's so important and critical. Like that is like required listening. If you haven't listened to episode 105 and you're listening to this right now, please go and listen to that episode. So you have to have this foundational level of base training, whether it's three months, four months under your legs before you actually start. And you need to make sure that you're not 
currently dealing with an injury is what coach Lou is really saying. Um, because the demands on your body are so much greater as you're running at this faster speed. Um, so I think this is really, really important before we even proceed further um, in this conversation to make sure that if you're listening to this and you're like, before we get into how do you do it, um, we're going to give you examples of like workouts you can do um, is make sure this is like the safety notice this is like the red flags, make sure that you are actually appropriate <laughs> to implement interval runs into your training. Um, because the last thing I ever want for any of you listening to this is for you to implement it. And then you're like, oh, now I got an injury. I hamstring tendon starting to hurt my Achilles. My runner's knee came back. My IT band started acting up. Um, that's the last thing I want. And then the other thing I would say is like, which is in the base training episode is like, you should be strength training. We, we should know that by now that we, we should have a foundational level of strength, not just running but we should have strength training incorporated into our program. So we have that foundational strength and our running form is actually better before we start running faster and putting more force and demands through our joints, our tendons and our ligaments. So safety notice there from your local or your virtual online running physical therapist there. Uh, so thank you, Lou. I appreciate you mentioning all of those comments. Um, very, very important. Um, and I like how you noted that, you know, the first step is really starting with the strides and not going at that high, high intensity for a longer duration. And we'll talk about, you know, um, duration and all of that. Um, but yeah, I, I just want to give a shout out. Roger said he wants to go faster. Lisa, thank you so much for joining the live. Uh, Kathleen says she wants me, 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 me. She wants to go faster. Katya raises the hand. The hand emoji. Uh, she wants to go faster and Lindsay wants to go faster. And Holly says, thanks. Coach Lou is the best. Um, give me a little shout out there. All right, guys. So now interval runs, where is the best place to do these coach? Where should I go to get in my interval runs? Do I just do them right out my door or do I need to go to a special place? I hear about this track. Tracks is best because it's very precisely measured. If you go to any of the high school, they are, each lap is 400 meters, very precise. However, as people in Northeasterners here, that when it's usually covered in snow in winter. So that can be difficult. There are alternatives. First, Tramio. Tramio, there's a lot to talk about Tramio. You can program the treadmill, you can alternate between the speed. What I want to warn you is that do not use a watch because the watch, it, it doesn't, when it's indoors, it doesn't have the GPS. So you only detect your form and then sort of estimate your pace from the, your arm movement and the cadence and the form and that assume that you have the same form but then when you do interval, you are not having the same form because the fast runs and slow runs, you are running differently. The mechanics is different. Then even if you calibrate your watch, it calibrates to average form, which is not right for either the fast or the slow run. So the watch just, no, no, no. So go with the treadmill. The, the reading is slightly off. There are some calib calibration for that if you're really strict, but usually it's, it's fine. So go with the reading on the treadmill. And there's some, many of the treadmill even have this interval setting. So you can switch between two speed, which is very easy. And then you just press a button. So you go fast and go slow. So treadmill is a good way. Um, the Excellent. another so option, treadmill so is one alternative. And then just to throw in there, guys, for those that have never been on a track before, the 400 meters is one lap around the track, right? So 400 meters is a quarter of a mile. All right, we double that. We do two laps, that's a half a mile. We do three laps, that's three quarters of a mile. And we do four laps is one mile. And I know that may sound silly to some of you, but honestly, that probably took me like a good year to figure out when I first started running. I would get so confused all the time and I it would like throw me off. 
So I just want to kind of reiterate that for those that have never been to a track before and you're thinking about like, what is 400 meters, how much distance, uh, just to give you a little perspective there. So if we can't go to the track, the track's mm -hmm. filled with ice or snow. If you're in a cold weather environment or you have your local sports teams like hogging the track and you can't get your run in, um, treadmill is an option. We just need to be careful about the calibration with the watch thing and not let it stress you out because your pace is not going to be accurate basically is what coach Lou is saying gps doesn't know how far you're running in place essentially it thinks you're running in place so it can't calculate your proper uh pace and we did cover some of that in coach cat's treadmill episode um so if you are a treadmill runner definitely make sure you check out coach cat's uh treadmill deep dive in everything you need to know about treadmill running. Um, okay. So besides the treadmill, any other places we can go to get in these interval runs? Yes. If you are not that um, strict, you can do find a lab locally and then measure it either with GPS or bike or whatever. So use that as a, your mini track yourself. There are something you can buy it's like a magic measuring wheel. You can find it in Home Depot. So it has a, you can go, 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 and then measure the distance. So you can do that on a local flat, let's say flat, a relatively flat place, make it a lab. I prefer that than back and forth, just because if you do back and forth, there's a huge, especially when you do like very fast runs, when you turn back, that's really, that's that's really hard you got to slow down and it may bring you into injury so find a lab a small lab maybe a few streets um, and then mark it so that's one way look measure it with a measuring wheel yeah so or, if you're doing like out and back from what you're saying it's almost like that old like shuttle run <laughs> adage right like if you're running fast and you have to do like a 180 degree turn right and go in the opposite <laughs> direction basically you have to cut right? You're, it's like cutting. You're turning us distance runners into like cutting athletes. And we are not cutting athletes. And most of us in our middle age years, uh, we probably don't want to be cutting when we're running really fast, uh, just for sheer of running a risk of an ankle sprain or spraining our knee ligaments, uh, you know, blowing out your ACL, stuff like that. Uh, we want to avoid that sharp cutting is what coach Lou is saying. So basically, uh, making sure our turns are not as sharp as an out and back. Okay. Got it. So the final way is still to utilize the GPS. If you have Garmin, you can program something in Garmin Connect or if you have a final search as our coaching platform, you can program something and syn synchronize with Garmin. And you can have this, for example, this 800 meters run and 400 meters recovery, that kind of. And so then Garmin will use a GPS to measure 800 meters. And then when it's, when it's done, you it move to next step. So, so it tell you to, tells you when you start to run and when you do recovery. But another thing is that if you do that on a track, just forget about this, turn it off because it's super inaccurate on the track. It, it can be different as much as 10 seconds per mile or even 20 seconds per mile, we'll get back to that. So it's gonna be super wrong on the track. Do you recommend, since you're, I know we're gonna get into track workouts, but my mind just went there right now. Um, do you recommend a certain lane to run your intervals in? Do you like run in lane one or should you like run in the middle lanes, like four or five? So only the lane one is 400 meters. Okay. So each lane increases. Lane eight is 430 something meters. So the lane wise around 1.2 meters so that you can do some calculation map and things. <laughs> so yeah, only lane one is 400 meters. Oh. And one mile is actually six, 1,609 meters. So that's not exactly four laps. So if you are super precise, you have to run a little towards the outside of the lane. So that's, that's all assuming you are super precise. Okay, all right. Yeah, See, so I told you guys. 
Coach Lou is a numbers guy and he, he would know this kind of stuff. So yeah, let's, let's do that. I kind of um, stole your thunder there and we started talking about specifics of the track, but let's get into kind of how we actually run these intervals and how do we do a track interval? Um, so let's say I'm a beginner runner or novice to interval running. Maybe I've been running for a couple of years, but heck, I've never gone to the track before. Um, you know, what do I need to know to really get the best out of my track workout? You've already shared like one golden nugget that basically you want to run in lane one versus running like the outer lanes, um, to get more accurate and also to not utilize GPS no. for your track workouts, um, really utilize the distance of the track as being your accurate. And again, I would maybe put a caveat to that, um, Lou, if that's okay, is if you want to be super precise and there's going to be many people who are listening to this, who they don't want to be super precise. Right. So again, if you are really training hard, and you're really trying to get a PR, you're trying to get a BQ, you're trying to like crush Boston, then you want to be super precise. But if you're really just looking to get a little faster and yeah, it'd be nice to maybe get a PR on a half marathon, you probably don't need to be super precise. So I don't want you to like stress out that, you know, you don't have everything covered and it doesn't need to be like very complex either. Um, so what are some other tips that we need to know about doing these runs on the track? So the basic tra track is you want to find two lines. Thanks my friend, Dan, who showed me around the track and told me everything. So there's a proper start line where you have the numbers one, two, three, four, five, six, and it's a line. And usually there's a curve in front so that people can, they can either line together or they do it on, on the curve. So that's a proper start where you have one, two, three, four, five, six, eight. And across the field, there's another line. It may or may not have that one, two, three, five, six, eight, but there's definitely a line. So I'll call the proper start line and the 200 meter line. With these two lines in mind, you can do any intervals from zero, 200, 400, 600, 800, one kilometers, 1200 and so on and so forth. So yeah, so these two lines, one at the proper start and the one across. And usually that's what we need unless you're doing sprint. Right, so these okay. These two lines are super important. So for any of our distance runners, anyone who's really training 5K and above, you're not gonna be doing sprints anyway. You're not doing 100s. You're not like Usain Bolt, right? You're not trying to be like the fastest person in the world. Um, and it's probably definitely, or I, I would say it's definitely not going to translate into making you a better 5k, 10k half marathon runner, which again, when I first started running, I didn't know that. Um, so that's why I'm, I'm saying, uh, this might sound silly to some of you, but like, I literally remember the first time I went to a track, I like did repeat hundreds, um, just trying to run fast. And cause I didn't know. And I was training for a 5k. Um, so I, I bring it up because I've made those mistakes before. Um, just, uh, that's why we're doing this. Um, all right. So we got our numbers. We got basically thinking about being 200 meters apart across from the field, going where the line is. So right, um, before you are really kind of getting into the curve, right? So it's like, you're running the curve first for the first hundred, and then you're running the straightaway. It depends. Sometimes they have, usually, yeah, usually it's the proper start is right before the curve. Okay. Right. Perfect. Oh, and that, when we talk about this before, that also talk about, we are also talking, talking about the direction. Usually the right direction is going, when all the track race, they usually go the counterclockwise. But when, when we do the right direction, is that the watch should be, on the arm that's inside the loop. For example, if you're doing counterclockwise, that should be your left arm. If you do clockwise, that should be your right arm. Otherwise, it's gonna make a huge, even a bigger error. So, All right, to so make sure we're, right we're wearing our watch on our on our left arm, essentially. Well, some, if, you, if you do clockwise, if no one else is on track, you can do clockwise and then wear on your right arm. But right. again, if you're doing the manual lap, 
which that's what I say um, on the, on track you do many lap, and then you really don't have to worry about the watch. So you can wear you, whatever arm it is because you're doing many lap. Whenever you hit the lap button, that's and then you look at the time in between. You are not looking at the pace because it's off. You're looking at the time in between, and then you know lap time exactly what you want. All right, so you're looking at how long it takes you to actually run that lap if yes. you were doing one lap, so let's say 400 meters, right? So you're looking at that as opposed to what your actual pace is because the pace is not going to be as accurate um, because of the GPS limitations you've mentioned already. Right. Got and, it. Right, and also, so always use the lap button and make sure you set the watch to the right screen Usually you want to watch, you can customize the screen that shows the lap distance, lap elapsed time, at least these two fields. So that's when you, for example, you hit the start button and then you start to re record how much time has elapsed since the last time you press the button and the lap distance. And yes, and the distance you, you, you sort of use that, um, you, you look at the lines, you got, got a distance as well. But it's, it's, so it's not that accurate on the watch, but it's a good reminder for you. Sometimes we lo lost count of laps, especially when we do a lot of repeats, right? So that's also helpful. So you may want to have like a lap number as well, but the thing that's most important really is the lap time because yeah, the lap time is most important because that's you hit the button and everything else you you figure that out later. But the lap time, you can only see that from the watch. In that sense, you can use a non smart watch too, right? If you just want to see the lap time. So yeah, a dumb watch, right? A non smart watch. <laughs> stopwatch. That's what, that's when the old time when they don't have the technology. The stopwatch that works. Yep. Yep. So that you want to have school. Screen. You can go yeah. old school for your track workouts, guys. We don't need the fanciest uh, GPS and Garmin. However, I do like to have the workouts already like sent to my watch that helps me with the laps because I am one of those people. It's like, was that the fourth lap or the fifth lap? I'm like running. I'm like, which one am I on? And I always have to look down uh, at my wrist. I'm like, okay. Because um, after you do like the first two, I feel like from then it's like hard you because your mind starts thinking like you start counting down and you're like, okay, I got the first two under my belt. Those were kind of like settling in. Now I'm like really going. And then you're, you're, you're anticipating like your last two laps and you're like, okay, those I'm going to go like really hard. Right. I'm like empty the tank a little bit here. And, uh, but then it's like, did I think about it or am did I actually do it? I always get confused with that. So yeah, the watch definitely uh, helps out. <laughs> yeah, yes. Lap time, maybe lap count. That, that, that helps. All right. What else do we need to know about um, doing our interval runs on the track? Oh, the other thing for the lap, usually we set our watch to auto lap every mile. Um, so for shorter or every kilometer. So for shorter intervals, usually it's under one kilometer or one mile, so that's fine. But if you are a fast runner, maybe you, your interval is longer than that, then turn the auto lap off. It's just annoying when you, when you, want, when you think of a lot of things at the same time. You just, so you, you have, um, in this way, you only have to worry about auto, uh, press the lap, lap button when you hit the proper start or the other line. So, that makes things easier. But if you have to worry about the auto lab versus manual lab and things, it's too much. So right. That's, that's and it. turn off the auto lab. So what Coach Lou is saying most of our watches, and I'm pretty sure my Garmin like automatically defaulted to like every mile, it's going to tell me, hey, you ran a mile and this was your pace, um, which I actually like during my regular recovery yes. runs and my long run. Um, but he's saying that this would not be the best setting to have on. Well, for, you, for your if, interval runs, if your interval run is short, it doesn't matter because you press the lap button before that anyway. Right. As long as your True. interval is shorter than one mile or one K, then it's fine. But yep. if that's longer than different story. Got it. 
All right. So we covered the track. We covered the watch. Anything else before we get into actually how fast we will be running these runs? And before that, I think the other thing I want to say is warm up and cool down is so important because you're running at a very high speed, very high impact. If you're not warm, warming up properly enough, the tendons is like elastic, right? So when they're cold, it's easy to break. So you want to have a full warm up. Usually I say 20 minutes jogging. So that's a mile, one mile half jogging, maybe two miles jogging and do some strides. That will help you transition from the easy run to the fast run. And I usually add some drills too, and then cool down afterwards. Yeah, I completely agree. Um, couldn't agree more as I, as I age here in my uh, 40s, it definitely takes me longer to feel like I'm ready to actually run my interval piece, right? And run fast. Um, and I know it's a very common problem. And especially if you have a tendency to get tendon inju injuries, as Coach Lou said, just because the circulation, the blood flow isn't as good at the tendon. So it takes longer to warm up. Um, and not only, you know, we got to get that blood flow going. So like do your easy running nice and easy, get blood flow, and then go ahead and really do a nice dynamic warm up, right. And drills. And again, mm -hmm. we have a five minute dynamic warm up, including drills on our spark your training YouTube channel, um, that I do before all of my interval runs. And then I follow that up with strides. Um, and as coach Lou said, it, it's really remember those strides is you're pretty much going like a hundred meters, but we're actually doing it to really focus on our form and like, you know, our running economy and making sure that that form is, is where it needs to be. Then that you're running fast in a relaxed manner without stressing the cardiovascular system yet, right? That you will be stressing it with your interval run when you're doing it longer than that hundred meter distance. Um, so those are super, super important. I couldn't agree more. Um, and I know you even recommend too, that if, you know, if you don't have enough time, cause like, we're all busy, we got to like rush to work. And like, how many times have you been like, Oh my God, I can't believe the time. Like I got to like take a quick shower. You're like rushing around to get out the door to get to work. Definitely been there way too many times, um, that we need to cut the reps and not the, the warm up. You know, you, you can't cut the warm up and even the cool down, um, you know, at bare minimum, I know you recommend like five to 10 minutes, right. For like at a least. cool down. Um, so we got to cut the reps, even though that's like the fun part of the workout. And you feel like that's going to be the difference maker. If you're not taking care of those tissues, um, again, that repeated stress without the, the, the love that they need, um, with a warm up and a cool down is really what is going to escalate and culminate, you know, with your subsequent runs and then getting these kind of common overuse injuries. So thank you yeah. so much for bringing up that point. Um, Lou, I think that's really, really important point, um, for those to, you know, go home away with today. So how fast should we be doing our interval runs or like what pace, um, should we be doing these runs? So yeah, that's the old answer. It depends, <laughs> but um, yeah, it depends on the per person and depend on your fitness level. We have talked about the pace in our previous episode. And so check on that. There's episode 72. <laughs> yes. Episode 72. 72, Coach Lou shared about what pace uh, should you run. And those listening on the podcast, I will definitely have all of these episodes we're referencing um, with links in the show notes. So check those out. And on Facebook, I've been dropping the links right there in the comment section. So if you're watching this video on Facebook, um, you can get those links right within the comments. Right. And then you can calculate it's a B dot kind of calculate or just listen to the, to the coach or use RPE. A lot of things, a lot of ways. Yeah. So using RPE, what's the easy way? So I guess, so really what Lou's talking about is the VDOT calculator that we, we utilize and we recommend for our athletes. Um, you can punch in those numbers. If you have a recent race time, that is your current running fitness of a half marathon or a marathon or a 5k, whatever race you've done, you know, you can get 
your interval pace there. Um, but RPE, so rating of perceived exertion scale from zero to 10, where do you want your runners to be at when they're doing these interval runs? How hard should they be working? Usually for intervals, nine to 10, which means I usually do the first rep slower. So that's usually start with nine. And then as we took towards the last lap, usually the last lap is almost 10. So nine to 10. That means it starts with nine and progress to 10 as, as the fatigue accumulates. Yeah. And I will add in there, it really, you know, again, that old word, it depends. Um, you know, really what Lou is talking about is himself and uh, some of, you know, his um, Boston Marathon runners right now, you could be going to a 10. But again, if you're just starting out with these, I probably don't want you emptying the tank fully and getting to that 10 mark. Again, just because if you've never done these runs before, um, it does take a while for your body to adapt, right? To the demands of running, just like any running that we do. Um, so, you know, I would just caution and bring that number down slightly to a uh, nine being the highest number. So like usually I'll tell, especially for, you know, again, you know, you're not super fast to begin with and you haven't done a lot of interval training in your history um, that they should probably be at like an eight to a nine. Um, so again, if you are at this higher level, you're at loose level here, then you can definitely be hitting that 10 mark. And then I'm going to give the caveat is you're injury free, right? You're not yes. struggling with the current injury. You're not battling a stubborn Achilles right now. Um, then yes, you can kind of empty the tank, so to speak. Um, and then making sure, and this is where a good coach comes in, right? That you have the recovery needed in your weekly training plan to make sure that if you are going to attend that your body is actually recovering because we see so many runners, right? Lou is that they, they go to a 10 and then the next day they're starting to add miles and they're starting to add in workouts and they're starting, you know, they're not giving their body the, the time it needs to recover. And then I'd be remiss to not mention nutrition as well in there and sleep, um, for recovery. So all of those factors really play a role and all of those other factors that don't involve running um, are super important if you're going to be running at that high, high intensity um, with these interval runs. Slow down your easy runs too. <laughs> Excellent. If you run at 10, right. If yeah. you run at 10, next day, your easy run is not going to be too fast. <laughs> right. And that's actually one of the uh, tactics I know Lou likes to utilize with our athletes is um, those who are not running their easy runs slow enough, um, because we know that is a, a common problem, uh, that most runners struggle with is running those easy runs slow enough. And they're running kind of what we call in the gray zone, um, is we do make sure that we push them on their interval run. So the next day they're kind of have to run easy because their legs are shot and they're kind of fatigued and they're like, Oh, that's what you meant. Okay. Now I get it. Um, and, or we know that some of our athletes aren't running their slow runs slow enough if they're not able to hit their paces for their interval runs. Right. So again, how we get faster as runners is having that dichotomy in our training that our hard runs are hard and they're fast and they're strategic in your plan. And those easy runs are easy and they're meant to be there for a reason. Um, and they're working on different energy systems. So whole different kind of goal and intention um, for those runs. So then how long should an interval run be, uh, Lou? So the interval runs depends on the distance. Um, for VO2 max, well, the, the science behind it is that the VO2 max workout shouldn't be more than five minutes. So usually for, unless you're really fast runners, that means you're doing 400, 800 repeats. Or if you're running, you're, you're racing mostly 3K to 10K, you may do 200 meters for speed and form. And 400 to 1K for VO2 max. If you're doing half marathon, full marathon, you do 400 or 800 for your speed, maybe strides for the form, and 800s 
and sometimes 1k for the for the intervals. And there is this Yasuo 800, which is found that um, your, for example, you're run, running a full marathon. So the full marathon time in terms of hour and minutes, you can translate to the interval time in 800. For example, if you're running three hour and 40 marathon, that means you can run 800 in three minutes and 40 seconds. So if, okay. you, do, if you keep doing that 800, maybe 10 of them, that in theory, you can run a 340 marathon. In but theory, I remember you had minutes. mentioned that to me last summer when you were coaching me for my half marathon, that yes. I was running those 800s around there, right? I think I was around that 340 mark. And you're like, oh, you can get a 340 marathon. I'm like, Again, um, but like you said, if I built up my long runs and my yeah. weekly volume for marathon yeah. training, uh, so that's interesting um, that you mentioned that. So that's the Yasso 800s, right? Is yes. that what that what's called? Okay. Um, and so these should be our primary goal is to work on our VO2 max. So essentially, from what I heard from what you just shared, is you're essentially running. If that's your goal, primary goal, VO2 max, you should be doing basically 400s, 800s, unless you are fast. And if, let's say, um, your half marathon time is a 138 or less or faster, right? Um, then you could be doing 1200s into your kind of half marathon training. Or if your marathon time is a 230, which sounds really ridiculous, um, then you could be doing like repeat miles to work on VO2 max, yeah. right? Is that what, what I heard? So yeah. really essentially for us kind of um, average runners, I'm going to put myself in that bucket. Um, so I'm like around a 144, 45 half marathoner. Um, you know, I should really be using my 400s and 800s for my primary goal in my training for VO2 max because my interval should not take me longer than five minutes to run, essentially, is what you're saying. No. No. Okay. Yeah. Got it. Maybe even four minutes, just five minutes, just too much. Um, so maybe four minutes. Okay. And if it's taking us longer, then we're starting to actually work on almost like different energy system, right? Now we're getting into yes. like tempo runs essentially. Yes. And then those should be run at our threshold pace. So right. different pace than what we're kind of talking about our interval pace. Different pace, different purpose, different, totally different workout. Because we do have this interval cruise, which tempo cruise. So you have one mile tempo pace. So that's tempo pace, not interval pace. Tempo pace followed by one minute jogging and then one mile tempo again, but that's tempo pace and that's the tempo cruise, which is at the RPE of seven-ish, seven to eight, depending on how hard you're pushing. So seven to eight, and that's for your, for your endurance, lact lactate, acetate clearance. So that's for a totally different thing that how, you, how your body can clear those acids that build up in your muscle and how, um, how to function still with the high ex, um, lactic acid content in your muscle and still keep going. So that's a totally different thing. But it's all, in the end, all help with the running, but the training, to train specifically for that, you need a tempo pace. That's right below your threshold pace. So the other thing to take away is that every run, just do not, do not just go out and run. You think of the, purpose of this run. Great point. Great point. Um, so then how often should we be doing this interval running? You shouldn't do more than once a week. And the volume is huge, no more than 8% in, in a section. The, the volume for the actually hard run shouldn't be more than 8% of the total mileage. For example, if you're doing 25 miles a week, 8% is two miles. That means if you're doing 400 repeats, right? Um, one mile, about four times 400, so that you shouldn't be more than doing more than eight times 400. So okay. that's the, the actual that's a good workout example. time, right? I like it. So if we're doing about 25 miles per week, yeah. which can be probably a very common 
um, volume, running volume for most people listening. Um, okay. You really shouldn't be doing more than eight by 400 meters. No, right. So you shouldn't be doing 10 by 400 meters. You shouldn't be doing eight by 800 meters because then you're going more than 8% of your total weekly mileage essentially is you're running at this faster interval pace. Okay. Too much. Yes. All right. Thank you for clarifying that. That was a good example. I think most people can kind of relate to and, you know, think about, I got, I want you guys to think about as you're listening to this. Okay. How many miles a week am I running? Um, let's do 8% of that and find out how, how long, right. And total distance you should be running at these interval pieces. All right. And make sure that you're not exceeding that, especially if you are someone who, when you tend to go to the track, you always find yourself getting injured. Um, all right. So think about that. All right. And then, so let's get into now, let's do some like, um, real world examples Mm -hmm. of we have a client we're working with the first time we're actually doing interval runs ever. So if you're listening to this, you've never done interval runs before. You're like, Hey, this is pretty interesting. Yes. I want to get faster. Wow. I've never heard about this. Um, I thought every run should be the same pace every time I go out the door. Oh, I want to get faster. I need to run faster on specific days and slower on other days. Um, what's the first type of interval run that you would program, um, for a client? We always start with strides. Actually, we start with stride. Francisco, right? Shout out to Francisco. We started stride, the first ever interval run on the parking lot. So that's, um, if you've never done any intervals, start with strides. And I usually do three, well, you can start with one or two strides and 30 seconds each. And the stride is, fast leg turnover and relax upper body. Ideally, the, it should be at one mile pace, but we don't really do race one miles, right? And also, how can you tell what pace you are at? So that really doesn't, doesn't really work, especially if you use GPS watch, it takes some time to catch up your pace. And, and when, when you catch up, finally catch up with your pace, it's, it's done. So that doesn't work. Right. I would say just feel relaxed, but fast leg turnover, 30 seconds ish, 30 seconds run and 30 seconds jog and repeat three times, two to three times, usually twice a week at the end of a run, uh, the end of an easy run. So you start with that. You can, from, from zero, you always start with one section one section, maybe two times three, 30 seconds strides in one of the, at the end of one of the easy run and then progress to three at two of the easy runs. And sometimes I'll say you do longer strides, one minute strides. So usually 30 seconds to one minute. All right. So strides are the first step um, that we're doing at the end of our easy runs, maybe doing once a week, maybe adding in twice a week, and then progressing the reps that you're actually doing those strides, as well as progressing the duration that we're doing them. So doing them, maybe start with 30 seconds and start with 60. And I'll just reiterate that those are not sprints. And, you know, think of gradually ramping up, right, your speed, and then you're getting to that you know, top speed, if you will. Um, and then gradually ramping it down, um, as you're doing those strides. So it's not like the old shuttle run test in uh, school where you're like all out sprint, grab the eraser, turn around 180 degrees, don't blow out your ACL and then, uh, drop the eraser back down. Uh, this is not what we're talking about. And again, the primary goal is just leg turnover and running form and being relaxed in your running form and not tensing up. All right. So that's our first step. So now if we've been doing that, then what would be another example? Let's say I'm a half marathon or um, I got a spring half marathon coming up. I got a fall half marathon coming up, depending upon when you're listening to this podcast episode. Um, You know, what are, what are some examples of what I can do at the track? Track. Okay. So that assuming so snow's melt. Okay, right? his snow's melted. Yes, <laughs> you don't want to get, you don't want to fall. So usually, try to still do twenty minutes jogging. So one mile, one point five miles, 
and then do the strides, drills, and after that, jog or lap before you actually start. Then this example, you have four times 400. So you do 400 fast run and then 400 jogging recovery. And four times 400, 400, usually you write it as this way, four star times 400 slash 400. So it looks like an equation, but it just 400, 400 fast, 400 slow, which is super easy for you. You just find any line, usually prop, proper star line, go there and then press lap button when you run past the line. And then you just run the whole lap back, press the lap button again, and then start jogging for one lap and then repeat. And you do four times. At the end, do one mile easy run. So that's four times 400. That's one mile of hard work. All right. So we're starting out with our repeat 400 meters. We're one lap around the track. And Coach Lou says we usually start by like four repetitions of that. Um, I would say that's pretty typical for most of our clients um, that we're starting them with four reps of it. But just to reiterate, you got to do that warm up. So, and it, d- again, depending upon how much time you have, um, sometimes I'll get away with doing a mile warm up, but then making sure that I do a good dynamic warm up and drills and strides yeah. before those repeat 400s. Um, Coach Lou does like a longer warm up. Um, so you could do up to, you know, let's just say your easy pace is 10 minutes just to make easy numbers there. You know, you could do a two mile warm up. Um, so you're running for 20 minutes. So again, depending upon how much time you have, but you know your body best and you want to make sure you feel nice and loose. You want to feel limber. You want to feel ready to go. You don't want to feel anything is pulling, anything is tight, anything, because if it feels tight before you even start running at that eight, nine effort, um, most likely it's going to get tighter and we don't want to pull anything, right? Um, so making sure you're doing that warm up. So you're really sandwiching your easy running, beginning in the warm up and doing a nice dynamic warm up drills, strides, and then the faster intervals. So we're doing 400 meters, one lap around the track, and then recovering for um, 400 meters. And make sure, I always tell my clients, like, make sure you recover for these, right? Like allow that heart rate to recover, come back down. Because for me, I really am more concerned with you getting that leg turnover and running fast um, and hitting that pace. Sometimes I find that people don't recover enough. So then they just tire out right? So they're not allowing that recovery in between. So in the second rep, the third rep, the fourth rep, and you kind of know you did this if you keep getting slower, right? With your reps um, that you didn't allow that proper recovery. So make sure you allow that proper recovery. And again, for those that are coming from like the fitness industry and the fitness world, and you guys are like, you like love the boot camp classes and the hit classes, and you just love like your heart rate being like elevated the whole time. Um, this is not what this is for. Um, again, this is for getting your body adjusted to this VO2 max, running in a faster pace, getting quick leg turnover, making your muscles stronger at this faster pace so you can be a more efficient runner and to get you faster. It's not to keep your heart rate elevated as high as possible till you feel like you're going to pass out. Um, and if you run these properly, you know, you should be able to hit those fast times where you, like Lou said, <laughs> you could take yourself up to a 10 out of 10 um, or a nine out of 10. So you're, you're huffing and puffing by the end. That last hundred is hard. You're huffing and puffing. Um, but make sure you allow that recovery time. So I just want to stress that importance. So we do that four times reps total, right? So 400 meters. 400 in between recovery. And at the end, nice and easy. That's when I like throw on my podcast. I definitely don't listen to podcasts during my interval runs. I'm a music guy. uh, So that's when I have my pump up music uh, that gets me through those. But that last, that last mile, mile and a half, I throw on my podcast, go nice and easy. Let's just get recovery miles in um, and just be proud of the effort because these are hard workouts, guys. So you need to be proud of yourself um, when you do these. And then also, if you're new to this, have some grace with yourself 
And, you know, especially if you're using the calculators and you're looking at pace and you're like, oh, I should be doing these at this pace based upon my race time. If you're new to these and you haven't done these before, you're probably not hitting that estimated pace. So it takes a little while for your body to adapt, adjust, have grace with yourself. Um, I've worked with athletes before that start these workouts and they just get disappointed because they didn't hit their pace. And remember, just like we always talk about treadmill running or any type of running, like effort means more than the actual number on the watch and the pace. So as long as you're working at that effort level that you should be, that it's a seven, eight, eight, nine, right? Eight, nine, maybe a 10. Um, then that is all you need. Because as Lou mentioned before, like I'm sure his runs right now, their times are probably different in this cold weather that he's running in than they were back in when you were training in the fall, right? right. When you had like cooler weather, maybe in September and early October. Um, but then you had the other extreme of hot weather in August and July that you were running in humidity. Um, so weather is going to be a variable. Again, if you're doing these on the track, it's usually not elevation. That's the variable, but weather is the variable. Um, and then also sleep, right? Um, sleep and how, how much stress you're under and how much stress you've been under at work. All of those variables make that run so much harder and you might not actually hit the number on your watch, but remember, it's all about effort. Okay. So those are a repeat 400s. So now let's say Lou, I am training for a marathon. Maybe I'm training for my first marathon, maybe mm -hmm. my second or third, hopefully mm -hmm. second and third, if you're adding in interval runs, um, mm -hmm. or you you've experienced with interval right. runs, right? You've done them for like your half marathon training. Um, you know, what's an example of a workout someone can do who has some experience with interval runs, or they're going back for their second or third helping of their marathon distance. So, yeah, so this should see this example that. If, for example, if you have 40 miles a week, remember the 8% rule, that means you can do up to 3.2 miles of repeats. And then this workout, you have two miles easy warm up, and then the stride drills and jog around. And then you do 800, six times 800 with 400 recovery. That means you go to the start line and then hit the button and then jog to, no, sorry, run to, run to laps. And then when you come back, hit the lap button again and jog one laps and then repeat six times. And that's 800, you know, you also 800. So that's, if you're doing 340 marathon, if you finish, it's around 340 marathon, then you're gonna jog the two, you're gonna run the two laps in three minutes and 40 seconds. If you're more precise, that means each lap is one minute and 50 seconds. To be more precise, that means every 200 seconds, every 200 meters, you can check your watch. So you start at zero, and then you look at the 200 line. So that's 55 seconds. And if you run too fast, too slow, you adjust accordingly. And then you come back, you compare with one minute and 50 seconds. And then you hit the 200 meter again, look at, oh, that should be two minutes and 45 seconds. So you address all the time. So that does help you to be super precise. But okay. yeah, that's, uh, that's very precise. And after that, we do two miles easy cool down. The, another thing I want to add is you talk about the recovery that there are actually two types of intervals. One is we call repetition. So you go really hard and then you do recovery super slow. So your heart rate totally drop. So then you go, that's the repetition. That's for your running form, which is good for the, when you start with the 400 and things. But then once you get into longer runs, you may consider the other type. That's the traditional intervals that you don't allow your heart rate to drop too much because you want it to work at a high heart rate as much as possible. And so that's two types of intervals if you want to be more, more specific. That the other one is called repetition at the at, at the faster speed. So it runs at faster speed, you full recover, and then you go at faster speed. So this one, the interval, you go out at not that fast speed, but pretty fast, and you drop the heart rate a little bit. And the reason that you don't want it for full drop because you want to the heart rate to stay at the high zone as much as possible. 
So you just allow this to drop a little bit and it doesn't take you as much time to get back to the high power for the next interval. And to do that, you, if you cannot hit the pace, you just adjust the pace. So every, just do everything slower altogether. So that's Got it. slightly So would you recommend, thank you for that clarification, by the way, would you recommend um, if someone was starting out with 400s, should they kind of strive for more of that repetition for a couple of weeks and then try to get into the traditional interval? What are your thoughts on, what do you recommend for your runners? The, that um, I will probably go with um, the, the intervals because that uh, repetition, you can just do strides instead. Okay. It's it's about the same. It's about the same purpose that you go very fast and then you fully mm -hmm. recover and then very fast, so that okay. maybe strides better. Right. And strides right, right. less less stress. Right. You don't have to worry about all the sequence. You don't have to go to the, um, the track, so that's easier. Right. And then you do the intervals instead. Yeah. So maybe could you give us an example of so for instance like when you're out there for your strides. Uh, or not your strides, your interval runs during your intervals, your heart rates, probably your younger guy here. What are you hitting? Like one nineties in, on your, on your watch, like heart rate wise. Actually it's oh. usually like one seventy something, one eighty. I don't 170, 180. Okay. All right. So like yeah. 170, 180. So then during your recovery, before you go for your next interval rep, what is your heart rate going down to? Usually like 150 something. Okay. Okay. So you're in the 150. Okay. All right. So it's all right. Perfect. Um, that gives me an idea. And would, what would you say your heart rate is usually during like your easy runs, Lou? 130, 140. Okay. All right. Yeah. Nice. All right. So that gives an idea. It's slightly higher than what your heart rate would be during an easy run. Right. kind of during that recovery and then you're going for that you know next rep eight nine effort mm -hmm. level okay so that that gives a a little perspective there um that i think would be helpful so it's mm -hmm. slightly higher than your easy pace um yes. runs and so for me for my easy pace runs like again it feels like a five effort but my heart rate is a little higher, I'm not as conditioned as you, of course. Um, so my heart rate's like 148, 150 ish. I feel like for my easy runs. Um, so I'm looking at, you know, I would expect my heart rate to be upper 150s, maybe 160 before yeah. I go for that next um, interval rep. Okay. So hopefully, guys, this is helpful for you to give you like practical examples of numbers, especially if you've looked at what your heart rate is. Mm -hmm. um, you know, during your easy run and during your interval runs. Um, all right. So thank you. That, that was a great example of a longer workout doing right. these repeat 800s and maybe doing six repetitions of them. And then right. this is all progressive by the way, guys, and how we program these as coaches is, you know, we're progressing them with each, um, with each week. Um, I just saw Katya's comment here. I'm so maybe you're not going slow enough on your easy runs coach. <laughs> I love it. I love it. I am though. I am. And trust me, I, 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 I'm forcing myself to go slower. I know that, but unfortunately my heart rate, it, it gets there and that's, that's my easy pace. Um, but I love, I love the comment because we're always stressing to our clients, um, that they need to go slower for their easy run. So I love that Katya has given it to me back. I love it. <laughs> um, so that was an example of kind of our, um, oh, I was talking about programming. So with each week, you know, sometimes we'll build up repetitions. So let's say we're doing 800, maybe we'll do four reps one week, five reps the next week six reps the week after, and then we have a recovery week, right? So, and you know, that's one thing too, is if you're adding these in, you're not going to do interval running mm -hmm. every single week forever, 
either. No. Right. No. So we've talked about that with like training cycles and cycling in where we're doing these harder runs for a specified period of time. And it's usually during when you're doing this kind of race training, right? This is like your half marathon training block or your marathon training block. Um, and then you're coming off of those and you're allowing your body to recover and they're all progressive. There's specific cutback weeks that are programmed in there for a reason. Um, so make sure for those that are adding this in and you're not working with a coach that you take all of those things into consideration and you're not like, Oh, coach Lou or coach Dwayne said, I should be doing six by 800 meters every week. No, no, I'm training no. for a marathon. <laughs> no. so make sure you don't take this out of context. Um, but thank you for sharing. Uh, hopefully these, these like practical tips were helpful for you guys. Um, so just to kind of bring this full circle here, guys, and what we talked about during this episode is really what is the interval run? We talked about the benefits of the interval run, really getting you to run faster. Um, you know, best place to run them. We talked about the track. Um, but we also mentioned, you know, treadmill is an option, a flat path is an option or trail is a path. These, uh, you know, uh, rails to trail pathways that we have in most of our communities are great because they're usually flat um, and they're straightaways. You just can't do them when they're super busy on the weekends and like there's all kids on bikes and rollerbladers out there and cyclists because uh, it really gets hard to get in your consistent interval pace. Um, so then we talked about like the basics of a track. How do you do the track interval? How fast you should be running these, what the effort level is, how long. So we talked about different distances, 400s, 800s. We talked about strides. Um, and then how often we should be doing these, um, within our training and our, our specific training cycles. And then we gave you specific examples. Um, so if you are listening to this right now and you're really struggling on how to actually program, um, you're running on uh, getting faster and adding in intervals for your race. Um, that's exactly what coach Lou and all the rest of our coaches on our healthy runner coaching team do. And we help runners, um, with our one-on-one -on -one coaching program. So we have a 16 week coaching program to get stronger and faster as a runner by providing you simple, easy to use run and strength plans right? That strength training in order to run is so important. And um, I've gotten some great feedback, actually, of some recent piece of people that I hopped on calls with last week um, who signed on to our program and, you know, mentioned that they're, they were shopping around and talking to other running coaches. And they were like, a lot of, you know, run coaches out there don't actually have a structured strength program, um, which I found quite surprising, but apparently is out there. Um, and they just kind of give them a couple of random exercises on YouTube. Um, so we have a structured strength program all programmed out for you for the 16 week duration that we're working with you um, with all videos, take the guesswork away and um, give that structure to you. So also support and accountability in order to really improve your running. So you can become an injury-free lifelong runner. And if you want to learn more, I'd be happy to jump on a strategy call with you to really see if you're a good fit um, for how we help runners crush their running goals and stay healthy along the way. Um, so if you're interested in learning more, just head to programs.sparkyourtraining.com forward slash coaching, and you can uh, schedule a call with me and we'll see if you're a good fit. Um, thank you so much, Coach Lou. Uh, always great to chat. Always great to get your wisdom uh, in that big brain of yours. Um, and thank you for sharing your expertise as you always do. And um, <laughs> and I'm looking forward to seeing you uh, go ahead and crush Boston again. We're going to be rooting for you. Your whole Healthy Runner community is behind you. We'll be tracking you again. And uh, we can't wait to see how uh, your first uh, spring Boston Marathon goes. Thank you. I'm very excited. Yeah. And uh, thank you to all of you who are listened and jumped here on the Facebook Live. Appreciate you guys. Uh, make sure. Every week we go live within our Healthy Runner Facebook group doing these live podcast episodes. Check out the event events tab right within our group to see what guests and topics. I've been scheduling a lot. We're like scheduled out two months out in advance. So we got a lot of experts coming on here, guys. There's going to be a lot of guest experts coming on. You guys are going to love these next couple episodes. Hopefully you love all the episodes, but trust me, like these guests are going to be awesome. They're going to bring the fire. Um, and thanks for those that watched on our spark your training YouTube channel, um, as well as listened on the podcast. Remember guys, 
if you found anything valuable here, all I ask yeah. from you is to share it, right? Copy that link, share it with a running friend of yours. And uh, thanks again. Remember, let's stay active, let's stay healthy, and let's just keep on running. Until next time, guys. Bye. Bye.